at their convenience. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jami'an, rahib bukum fi hadha al-awd li munaqashat nataij al-sana al-maliyya 2022. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, today. We are going to be presenting the uh, 31st December 22 uh, financial results. Um, I want to ask just before I start so that we can make this uh, go as smooth as, as possible. Um, does there, is there anybody who, uh, maybe I should ask it in Arabic, my question was going to be, should I keep translating every slide from English to Arabic? سؤالي إذا تكرمتم بس حد يخبرني الآن إنه إذا كان هناك حاجة لترجمة هذا اللقاء من الإنجليزي إلى العربي تلقائيا كل ما أعرض شريحة. Yes, في حد ما فهمته. إذا حد يرفع إيده مثلا. طيب إذا حد رفع إيده يعني وأنا إن شاء الله حاضر إني أترجم وإلا فإني بستمر إن شاء الله باللغة الإنجليزية طيب so in that case I will start the session of course we start with the regular disclaimer and because this is a recorded and going to be kept in our website this session I encourage uh, those to read it, and, and it's the standard disclaimer in terms of huge forward-looking statements and and uh, and so on. Um, I move on to the uh, contents. I will be first talking about the operating environment in Oman, the economy. I will move on to the banking sector in in general. Then I will talk about specifically Bank Masqat and its business lines, as well as the financial highlights. And uh, we will conclude after that with questions and answers. Sorry, I forgot to introduce uh, the team uh, here. My apologies. My name is Walid Al Hashar. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Bank Masqat. I have to my left is uh, my colleague Ahmed Al Belushi, who is the Chief Banking Officer. Uh, in front of me, I have uh, Mr. Ganesh, who is the Chief Financial uh, Officer, and I have Mrs. Sheikh Al Farsi, who is our Chief Operating Officer, also here with me. So I will uh, proceed uh, to talk about the operating environment. Of course, Alhamdulillah, Oman's economy has been quite resilient, as we have, and we have talked about this in the past. Um, and it continues to be so over the last five years, despite uh, depressed oil prices. Um, this was uh, made possible uh, from, through the government of Oman taking a number of initiatives and measures to support and diversify the economy, of course. Some of these initiatives, like within the manufacturing, tourism, logistics, agriculture, fisheries, have all been reinforced and continue to be reinforced. Uh, to enable the growth in these uh, sectors, a number of initiatives have been taken, including uh, changing and introducing new legislation and promoting foreign direct investments into Oman. Of course, also in particular during 2022, and uh, due to the recovery in the oil prices and, and the increase in Oman's oil production uh, and the momentum in the non a positive momentum in non hydrocarbon revenues. Strong financial measures taken by the government of Oman. The growth has been uh, strong. After a decade long uh, wait, the nation has witnessed uh, fiscal and external uh, surpluses in uh, 2022. The elevated levels of the oil prices have resulted in a fiscal surplus of about 1.15 billion against a budgeted deficit of uh, 1.55 billion. GDP is estimated to grow by about 4.5% uh, for, uh, for the first nine months of, of 2022. Uh, consumer price index uh, inflation has largely remained uh, muted at 2% in comparison to the global inflation average uh, nearing uh, 9%. The government was also able to utilize the excess surplus uh, in paying the public debt due to which debt to GDP ratio reduced from 61% uh, in 2021 to about 43% in 2022. 
these are all uh, positive uh, signs. Medium-term fiscal plan and Oman's uh, Vision 2040 also provides a firm and a positive anchor in the direction of the economic diversification uh, strategy, sustainable private sector growth, and a higher living standard. Um, budget 2023 is also another sign, uh, another positive sign for us, giving a growth positive expansionary budget, clearly focusing on uh, good investment outlays, covering a wide number of projects across a number of core sectors in the economy. Uh, the government uh, also expects the uh, economy will grow by about 5.5% in 2023. Uh, the momentum uh, in the positive momentum in the economy, of course, resulted in an upgrade in the sovereign ratings uh, by certain uh, rating agencies, and hopefully more of that will come uh, as well. In terms of the uh, banking sector, the banking sector in general has been performing relatively well during these challenging times over the past few years. Uh, in fact, some of the growth parameters which are shown in the, going to be shown in the next slide uh, shows that sectoral performance has been uh, good. And uh, banking, of course, has been supporting various businesses and business segments in Oman through its uh, credit, credit support. Sectors key parameters which include liquidity position, capital adequacy, asset quality are uh, at healthy levels. Uh, during 2022, the sector actually witnessed a good momentum also, supported by the economic uh, recovery and the positive macro outlook. Uh, sector credit portfolio increased by about 1.35 billion, uh, i.e. a growth of about 4.8%, uh, registering uh, a growth of about 4.5 percent uh, the year before at 1.2 billion. Deposits also increased by around 292 million, about 1 percent in 22, when it has seen a 6 percent growth in 2021. But of course, we understand the story in 2021 due to the lockdowns and so on, spending was, uh, was limited. Uh, Bank-wide net profits had also reverted back to pre-pandemic levels. As I had mentioned earlier, uh, the budget of 2023 20, uh, promoting investments in uh, key uh, core sectors of the economy um, with the elevated levels of oil prices and the lifting up of the pandemic related uh, restrictions and the government's continued focus on reforms and developmental strategies. We believe that this will further provide a, a needed booster for sectoral growth, helping it in achieving uh, even uh, better momentum and better financial performance uh, in the coming uh, period. In terms of um, the banking sector slides here, I can see that the stable growth in some of the key parameters, loan growth of around 4.4 percent, compounded annual uh, growth rate for the last five years, which is quite healthy, ensuring a good growth in customer deposits also of around 3.7 percent. Uh, in 2022, we can clearly see the momentum gaining traction in credit growth after a couple of years of uh, subdued economic activities uh, due to the pandemic. Profitability of the sector was stable until 2019. In 2020, it's understandable, banks globally witnessed uh, a, a sharp decline in, in profits, and Oman, of course, was uh, no exception. After witnessing close to 25% reduction, Net profits for the banks have improved uh, by almost 18%. So we're seeing them moving back towards uh, the pre-pandemic uh, levels and uh, even improving further. During 2022, we see clearly profit further improving by almost 27% uh, uh, year on uh, year on year. The sector anticipating it to grow at around mid single digits in terms of uh, credit and deposit growth going forward. There could be some short-term uh, impact, of course, and this is a continuation from the previous years in terms of asset uh, quality and uh, the collective provisions, but uh, also due to the global geopolitical uh, factors that are still there, the interest rate situations, uh, banks will have to continually uh, ma tactically, tactically manage their liquidity position, but in the medium term, uh, we expect to be a stable performance. Notwithstanding 
all the different dynamics that have, have been taking shape, of course, over the last couple of weeks and, and over the last two days in particular. Uh, all of these are different dynamics. Nevertheless, um, I think it's very important to keep the focus on the ball and, and move forward um, and keep watching what's, what the situation is, uh, is around us. In terms of the bank must up uh, strategy, of course, the bank's vision is, is focused on, on key strategic pillars on customers, on the market leadership that we have on efficiency and productivity, and of course, technology and, and innovations. These are the focus and will continue to be our focus in terms of the strategy to make sure that we deliver the best possible uh, returns and the best possible value uh, for our uh, all our stakeholders. Um, the bank must have business signs. This is just a quick uh, snapshot of the various business signs in the bank. Of course, we provide all banking services and uh, well-established business lines, including corporate banking, personal banking, wholesale banking, and Islamic banking. These uh, business lines have been performing quite well over the past few years and continue to do so. Uh, in general, corporate banking, personal banking, and wholesale banking contribute around 25 to 35 percent each, and Islamic banking is around 6 to 7 percent. Our overseas operations has, is coming back to the positive, contributing about 2 percent to our uh, bottom line. Islamic banking is uh, continuing to have a, a, a good, the highest market share in terms of assets in Oman and has shown uh, quite a healthy growth since its inception. The bank is quite well diversified in terms of loan portfolio, as you can see in the graph on the right uh, top side. And the deposit portfolio as well is quite strong, driven by deposits, in particular retail deposits, and also supported by government and, and private sector uh, deposits. In terms of now we go to some of the key financial highlights for uh, Bank Mustaf for the year 2022. You can see that the bank's top line performance was strong in spite of the continuing global and, and regional uh, challenges. Net profit was higher by 5.9% over the last year. Uh, this is uh, due to business conditions slowly going back to normal, along with the fact that, you know, the forward looking provisions that were made back in 2021 uh, has helped us actually moderate the levels of provision in uh, 2022. Non-funded income also had improved uh, in 2022, 13%, percent, uh, while some of that is due to gains on sale of uh, certain investments by the bank. Uh, there is also some healthy growth in, in the non-funded income. Operating expenses increased by about 8% relative to the growth in, in, in the business and the, act, uh, the activities that we do. We have uh, expansions in terms of our operations, and this is quite natural because of the fact that we have uh, been controlling costs over the past few years due to the pandemic and due to the situation, the, the oil prices and, and the, uh, the uh, challenges uh, that the economy was going through. Now we're coming back to normal business and therefore we have to continue investing uh, in, our, uh, in our businesses. Uh, in terms of the loan portfolio, it has also shown a, a healthy growth of 2.5% year on year and the deposit portfolio also showed a growth of 1.5%. In terms of the operating performance and profitability in, in specific, uh, this is a slide that gives a snapshot over the past few years. As you can see, the NIMS have been quite stable over the last five years, and uh, we have been able to manage the yield and the funding cost in order to maintain these NIMS at these uh, levels. The bank's fee-based fee income was stable also at around 31 to 35 percent of total income throughout this uh, period, and these are quite healthy uh, quite healthy levels. At the same time, our cost to income ratio consistently declined during 2018 to 2020 uh, because we have deployed a number of cost uh, reforms during that time to ensure that we align ourselves with the uh, subdued economic situation during that time and also continued with that during the uh, COVID, uh, COVID times. 
uh, matching it with the volatility that has that has taken shape in order to, to actually maintain a stable uh, a stable income uh, uh, stream uh, as far as, uh, as far a stable income result. Uh, now, due to the opening up of the economy, we can see a marginal uh, increase in, in the bank's cost to income ratio, uh, reaching to about 41.2% uh, in, in 2022. And that's intentional, actually, because we are back to reinvesting in our infrastructure and uh, the development of our uh, human resources. The ROE of the bank has also witnessed a significant improvement from the lower levels of 9% in 2020 to reach 10.5% in 2022, almost recovering back to the 2018-2019 levels. Um, higher profits, uh, and you know this is what has what has uh, helped uh, the ROE and also the positive impacts of the capital uh, structuring, uh, op uh, capital optimization exercise that the bank has done. Uh, during the fourth quarter of 2022. ROA continued to be quite healthy, reaching 1.55%, the highest when compared to the levels seen in the last uh, five years, uh, especially when it reached the lows of uh, 1.32 in, uh, in 2020. In terms of uh, asset quality, um, it gives you a snapshot of the trend in terms of asset quality. As you can see, the bank has been able to maintain an NPL ratio of around 3 to 4 percent th throughout this last uh, few years. Uh, the coverage ratio, however, has continued to be at much higher levels, ranging from 125 to 145 for the last four years. And now it has reached 163 percent due to the prudent and conservative uh, uh, policies that we take in, in, the, in the bank in terms of coverage for, uh, for uh, risk, uh, risky credit. And I, as I said, the bank's gross loan portfolio is quite well diversified. You'll see from the, from the slide, there is a prudent credit policy. The bank was able to grow the gross loan portfolios by about 3.3% in, in 2022. Um, the bank continues this prudent provisioning and credit uh, policy to ensure that our performance continues to be stable uh, as we as we move forward. This is the last slide that I have in terms of financial uh, performance. We talk about the funding and the liquidity situation of the bank. It's quite a well-balanced funding mix of about 70% coming from customer deposits and the balance from interbank uh, borrowings and, and equity. This has been quite stable position for the bank for the last uh, few years. The bank continues uh, to hold a uh, high level of liquid assets, and that has been the trend over the last few years. Um, and uh, as I mentioned e earlier, the bank's capital position is one of the highest, in fact, amongst the Omani peers, and one of also the strongest, uh, strongest in, in, in the GCC uh, peers as well. Uh, the bank's capital position is largely driven by the core equity capital, along with retained profits after paying uh, healthy dividends over the last uh, several, uh, several years. Of course, due to global challenges, including supply chain, high inflation in many markets, uh, rapidly uh, increasing interest rate scenarios, uh, recent uh, market developments in, in the U.S. And in, and in Europe, we will and we continue to tactically work towards liquidity management and interest rate management to make sure that our top line uh, remains uh, remains stable and healthy and, and robust. With this, I have reached the conclusion of uh, my presentation. I can open now the floor for questions. You can raise your hand, please, so that we can uh, uh, unmute you. Uh, uh, Ishan is uh, asking for you. Yes, Ishan. Hello? Yes, yes, Mr. Bishan. Welcome. A very good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for the presentation. How are you doing? 
Very well, thank you. How are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, you know, the question is with regards to cost of risk and how do you see that panning out? You mentioned that the bank was extremely prudent when, you know, COVID came and, and, and you know, you took provisions accordingly and currently you've built a sufficient buffer. And if you look at the coverage ratio, it's much higher than industry standards, right, at 160%. How do you see that panning out uh, over the next 12 to 15 months or over the next couple of years? If you could just give your thoughts on the same. Um, I think, you know, it, it will be similar. I, I can't give forward looking statements. And of course, it's very difficult to predict what is what's going to be the future. But I can reflect on the, the previous year in 2022. We don't see the situation requiring uh, any higher uh, levels beyond the cost of risk uh, that was achieved in 2022, frankly speaking, at this stage. So is that a fair statement, uh, Ganesh? So uh, yeah, we're going to continue to be prudent, obviously, and we're going to continue to be focusing on uh, good quality assets. And uh, those, uh, that level of uh, risk, uh, cost of risk is, is probably going to continue in the same, same levels as you have seen already. Noted, noted. Thank you. Uh, next question is, is with regards to, you know, the restructured loan book. And we've seen that across the sector. So it's, it's not like one bank is isolated. So the entire banking sector has seen a surge in restructured loans for, for obvious reasons. How do you as bank muskets see that panning out? I mean, as a percentage of, of overall loans, you're still on the lower end or, or along the average. But how do you see that panning out over the next 12 months? Again, you know, with forward looking statements is very difficult, but I, I can just take you back to the to the history and um, the current dynamics that are that have brought us here and looking at the positive momentum that is there. And if that continues and with all of these qualifications, we see that it's it's probably yeah, it's not going to be as worse. Than, uh, than where it is already. Um, yeah, there could be some certain uh, areas of stress uh, in certain uh, credits. Uh, but then again, you know, the situation that we have just come out of has been quite, uh, quite difficult. And there has been large exercises done for restructuring and trying to make sure that we align cash flows uh, to, repayment, uh, to repayment terms. So uh, from that perspective, I don't, at this stage today, I don't have any reason to make me believe that it is get, going, going to get worse. Now, again, you know, if the, if the dynamics globally change and the, the whole situation changes globally, that's a different uh, scenario. Uh, but if the current momentum continues, then I don't see uh, uh, any reason for me now to think that it's going to get worse. Noted. Thank you so much. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Mr. Abbas would want to ask this one. Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Abbas. Unmute, please. Uh, yes, good, afternoon, uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, good, good afternoon, Mr. Hajar. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, congratulations on a very, very good year. Uh, thank you for thank the capital op optimization plan. You know, it's, it's again a very unique sort of endeavor undertaken by Bank Muscat. Much appreciated by the market and minority shareholders as well. Uh, thank you. When you look at 23, how do you see credit sort of growth behave, especially in light that dollar funding is going up and maybe some of the GRE? Uh, growth demands can be met uh, by Omani Real. Do you do you see that sort of transition happening, and how do you see uh, credit growth behaving for Bank Muscat? Uh, that's my first question, sir. Okay, um, the, there are so many dynamics in the market. If you ask me the question, somebody can somebody is unmuted somewhere. I think. Huh? Abbas. Abbas, somebody's talking with you. Um, so, to go back, uh, the dynamics are changing rapidly. I and mean, this question, uh, if you ask it two months ago, and if you asked it four months ago, and if you asked it a month ago, they keep changing because 
uh, interest rate scenarios, uh, what we expected six months ago versus where we are where we are today, and so on. So from where I stood two months or three months ago, we were expecting single. Uh, uh, mid uh, mid single uh, digit uh, growth for the for the sector um, now of course with all the dynamics globally I, i'm not sure uh, to what extent how and to what extent that will have impact uh, globally and i'm not talking about oman here um, on uh, people's plans on further capital expansions and and so on it's it's a situation that we need to see and how it continues to uh, to evolve um, how liquidity globally is going to pan out um, when the dust sort of uh, settles down. Uh, but I am still optimistic. I'm still optimistic that the economy here is quite robust uh, and, 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 and the growth levels that we were projecting, we, we hope that that will be achieved. Uh, again, assuming that there is no, nothing drastic happens for a prolonged period of time. Um, globally. Unmute Mr. Abbas, I think he has a second. Okay, I, 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 I understand that. And how are you seeing uh, uh, in a rising rate uh, environment, how, is, how are you seeing domestic deposits and real liquidity behave? I mean, are you seeing the government continue to be a large provider of deposits? Uh, because, you know, when I, when I talk to other bankers, it seems there's like a, you know, there's a rush to sort of raise deposits, rates have gone up. So how, you, how do you see Bank Muscat reacting uh, in a scenario like this? We, you know, liquidity is, is, is reasonably well within the country. Now, you know, you have to look at it from both ways, not just uh, Romani Riyadh. You have to look at it also from the U.S. dollar, uh, US dollar side. From, side. From, 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 from our perspective, as the largest bank in the country, we, we, we want to make sure that we don't get into uh, this price war uh, within the sector. Otherwise, it's just going to uh, uh, to create a, a really a, a higher uh, an increase in, in the cost of funds uh, significantly. And that's why we are very closely managing our liquidity position to make sure it's at the optimal levels with uh, sound uh, buffers above above that. Uh, to make sure that we don't get into this, uh, not panic, I wouldn't call it panic, but in terms of, you know, uh, getting into a price uh, price war with, with, with other banks. And that's very important. Now, there are certain pockets where, of course, liquidity may be, uh, not liquidity, I think liquidity is there. It's at what price level is it going to be available? And yes, we understand that uh, yeah, the prices have, uh, have increased. That's where we need to continue to manage uh, our balance sheet and making sure that uh, it's, it's done uh, optimally. Uh, yes, there will be an increase in the cost of funds. Uh, that's, that's understandable. Where it will go, we, we don't know yet. Like I said, the situation, uh, well, if you talk to me in December, I had a, a different view. But uh, now, and I'm sure you would too, uh, you, you see the interest rates possible scenario changing given the the curve and where it went uh, last uh, last few days so yeah it, it's 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 still uh, volatile as far as cost of funds liquidity is is not the issue it's the price at which you can uh, you can get it at uh, but nevertheless if it's a short term, then I think it's it's not going to have that much of a of an impact. But if it it is prolonged, then that's a different uh, scenario altogether. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. My, my, uh, you know, I had another question. So, how do yeah. you in in a in a scenario like this when cost of funds is moving up, and you know, uh, how do you see? the pass-through mechanism work, you know, how, you know, what kind of conversations are you having with your customers and specifically on the restructured, you know, loans side, do you feel in, in an environment where interest rates are going up and we're just coming off a couple of tough years from COVID, uh, uh, the risk level, the risk uh, will, be, will remain elevated for the bank. Uh, you know, I'm trying to mix up in terms of how the mechanism of transferring this cost upon increase to end consumers at the same time, banks sitting on large restructured books companies that have been challenged for a while and specifically how will they behave so you know it's like a two-fold question sir yeah we have we have to be very careful uh, as a bank we have to be very careful in terms of this pass-through mechanism uh, 
it's it's not as straightforward as that and and that's what uh, relate where relationship comes in where understanding our customers business comes in where managing our balance sheet in, a, in an agile way uh, comes in tactfully uh, to make sure that we balance the cost of funds because it's not a straight through uh, process where the higher cost of fund means that we have to immediately pass that on through to to our customer because in some cases it could break uh, it could break those those customers so we have been quite uh, quite successful in managing that uh, throughout you know the past few years um, while making sure that our uh, nims remain uh, stable and i say this because that's how we work with our clients uh, there are, of course, on the technical side, we also have a, a, a floating uh, a book where that also gets passed through automatically. But notwithstanding that, I think it's beyond. It goes beyond that to where we actually have those conversations, but making sure that we work together uh, in a in a well calibrated uh, calibrated way. But uh, it's not it's not a straight through uh, it's not a straight through process, Abbas, because otherwise. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's, it, could be, uh, it could be with negative results. Unmute, uh, Mr. Abba. Yeah. I, yeah, thank you. I, I uh, appreciate those comments. And my last question is, you know, you mentioned that provisioning coverage is really, really healthy. It's, you know, it's the highest in the sector by a mile. Uh, some banks are even below the 100% mark. In an environment like this, do you feel bank muskets prudent policy, I mean, I mean, you've been prudent, but in the sense, do you feel you've been conservative and you feel like cost of risk coming down this year versus the last few years? Are we, uh, can we see lower rate of provisioning for Mang Muscat in this uh, year go, uh, and the year going forward? Like I said, I answered that before. It all depends on, uh, you know, we, what we have done in 2022 is something that we expect you know, to, to continue. Uh, unless the situation changes uh, negatively, but again, uh, these are you're asking me forward, uh, forward-looking uh, statements, and I'm, I'm just giving you guidance as to what we saw in 2022. Assuming that the trend continues uh, in the way it is, uh, we don't see any reason why that will get uh, worse. If it, you know, if the situation becomes even better, who knows uh, where we will, uh, where we will be. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashar. Uh, I, I think I'll just wait my turn at the back of the queue. I'm sure my colleagues have other questions. I have a couple of more, but I'll just wait my turn. Thank you for your answers. Okay. Any other question? We can come back to you, Abbas. It's no problem. Unmute Abbas. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for that. So, so now as a CEO of a bank that's, you know, you, you said that you had a one view going into the summer and then, you know, what's happening globally, you know, with interest rates, <laughs> with dollar rates, you know, what's happened to the banks. What's the one big priority for you as, as the CEO for this year, for, you know, where you'll feel like, you know, you and your team have done a successful job navigating these markets. What's that number one priority for you, sir? The number one priority is navigating through all the different dynamics that are taking shape with positive uh, positivity and hopefulness uh, moving forward. Uh, this is the number one priority as the CEO of, of Bank Muscat. Now, I'll tell you uh, why I am saying this. You know, you've seen the different dynamics, and, and now I'm, I'm, I will turn into Wali. View. This is my view, uh, and where where it's coming from. So it's not necessarily a bank masqat uh, view. I I'm responsible for this uh, for this view. You've seen the markets, and you've seen how you know the the Silicon Valley uh, issue. Now yesterday, uh, Credit Suisse, and that's still evolving. Now you know there are two ways to think of this. One is. Either we think it's it's worrying and it's a, God help us. It's you know some analysts are, uh, are equating it to what happened in the global financial crisis of 2008-2009, and the contagion effect and, and so on. And that's possibly one view. 
But I, I'm not even going to go there and I'm not even going to go that far. I think what's important to realize is that from those times in 2008 and 2009, the markets and in particular regulators and financial institutions have learned a lot of lessons and regulations are way different the, today than what they were before. Um, and the responsiveness of the regulators and the decisiveness of the regulators today is way different from what it was uh, in 2008 and 2009. The agility by which regulators today move and financial institutions move is much better than what it was in 2008 and 2009. So there are a lot of positive things, positive momentums, positive aspects today that are totally different from what it was back then. And it lets even help more. If you go, you know, COVID was unprecedented times. But you saw regulators, financial institutions, governments moving together in a fashion where they all navigated through this, this, this pandemic, this, this, this black swan event, this major event globally. And we came out of it as a, as a, as a global economy, alhamdulillah, relatively, relatively well. And they move, and that's, that's the kind of experience, that's the kind of diligence, that's the kind of agility that makes me look at it positively moving forward because I believe whatever dynamics are taking shape today, I hope that yani, reason will prevail, um, uh, calmness will prevail, panic and worry is unnecessary and hopefully you know, markets will see their way through uh, the, 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 high, the high seas or the rough seas that we are seeing today. Now I've said that I and mean, this is this is my my hope and and my my belief that that it it's it's definitely a, a different situation where we are where we are today. So I come back to my priorities as a CEO. My priorities as a CEO is to navigate through all of this and to actually help uh, those around us, uh, the stakeholders around us, also navigate through through all of this and make sure that uh, يعني, everything remains uh, calm and intact and, and moving forward. We actually stay focused on building business, uh, serving our customers better, building our franchise, making sure that our technology is resilient and developing, um, and uh, helping our people and our teams grow uh, and uh, and prosper within within our uh, organization. No, I really I really appreciate the answer. I mean, you know, it's very easy to be pessimistic, but you know, it's it, you know, uh, given everything that we've seen in the last few years, you know, I completely agree with you. And you know, I can't couldn't have said it better myself. I think there's reason to be optimistic. At the same time, one needs to be, you know, careful and cautious. And you know, you, your views really echo that. So I appreciate that answer. My my final question is, you know, as analysts, obviously, you know, a lot of the call, you know, I want to know what's going to happen in 23. What sort of growth are you seeing? And you know, you sort of avoid giving me a forward-looking number, but at the same time, you've answered Answer a lot of my questions. Now, let me just fast forward that for the next two to three years, you know, given that the competitive landscape in Oman banking is changing, given that, you know, we're coming off COVID years, there's a consolidation happening in the bank. How do you see bank market, be, you know, sort of fair in the next two to three years? You know, you feel like you're going to lose market share because there are much aggressive, nimble, smaller competitors coming for your market share. How do you see uh, bank must could behave and react to competitive pressures for the next two, two, three years in line of where you see Oman growth. I mean, that's my last question, sir. Thank you. No, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, this is a question that I ask myself every day. So and that's my duty to ask myself every day this question. What's going to happen in the next two to three years? That's my job as, uh, as the CEO. See, but I answer it this way. And uh, not with a leap of faith, but I answer it this way. I say that the bank has the right solid fundamentals in terms of its people, in terms of its talent, and in terms of its uh, balance sheet, um, in terms of its culture, uh, in terms of its infrastructure, and in, it's in terms of its assets. So with, with that combination, uh, we, when you have the right engine moving forward, I think, yeah, any, making navigational moves along the way and making agile moves along the way becomes 
that much um, more, uh, what's the word, uh, not easier, but uh, actually the logical, uh, the logical way. So, so as long as we have the right fundamentals, I think whether in competition, yes, it's going to be difficult. Of course, it's going to be challenging. But you rely on the fundamentals to keep on building and keep on looking at different opportunities, organically and inorganically, and see where you can navigate yourself with a, where, wherever, within your own markets, outside. We have a number of different tools um, at our hand. But what's important is we have the right people in place and the right support from the board of directors, the right support from the regulators, and the right support from the shareholders. I think it will, uh, you know, it, it will it, it will work out uh, very well for uh, for the bank, and uh, we're quite optimistic uh, moving uh, moving forward that we will be able to navigate through throughout all of these uh, challenges, and make sure that all continue to come out on top, inshallah. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, do you have like an ROE target in mind, but if everything goes according to plan, <laughs> do you go from 12 to 15 percent? <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish that, uh, my goodness, if I had that, I would be, uh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, unfortunately. I'm not unfortunately, but <laughs> if I had that target, I wouldn't, uh, I, I, it would be in my, my brain, but not, not even in my, pe in my team's uh, brain. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Good to talk to you and all the very best to you, you and the team for the next of, uh, remainder of 23. Look forward to interacting with you again. All the very best. Thank you, thank you Abbas. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question in the chat. Yes. From uh, Mr. Pushpipa Ramlinga. Yes. Uh, I'm just going to read out the question as it is. Uh, my question is on your debt mix. CASA percentage has remained more or less stable, and this has helped the bank maintain their NIMS. However, going forward, do you expect any shift in deposit mix, which could lead to NIM compression? Will the bank be able to maintain their current margin? Okay, uh, you know this is this is why we you know we we manage we manage the bank, and that's what I I had mentioned earlier. Uh, obviously, the cost of funds is a, a number of factors that uh, come to play. And it's the deposit mix that we have, and yeah, we see uh, uh, possible rise in cost of funds. Um, maybe in the short term, we don't know how it will continue or not for the long term. But we manage it through a number of uh, through a number of ways. Like I said, uh, quite uh, an agile and tactical uh, way when it comes to uh, our liquidity management. And uh, but we try to make sure that we don't. Uh, uh, and we, are, we remain optimal uh, in terms of our uh, liquidity, and we don't get into uh, uh, aggressive uh, pricing of uh, of deposits. And we try to make sure that our cost of funds is 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 managed. But uh, yes, of course, there is pressure uh, on uh, on uh, time deposits in terms of that particular mix, uh, in terms of rates uh, possibly uh, moving uh, moving up. Also, even in terms of the institutional, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, interbank uh, borrowings, that's also uh, that's also increasing. But we, we manage it, and we 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 manage the balance sheet, and we manage the liquidity, and and we see where it can, you know, where it, there are floating assets as well as floating liabilities, and and so on. But look at the history. The history of NIMS has been relatively stable, and that's due to the. Uh, decent management of, of this. That, now I'm, I'm looking at the situation and how it will uh, today and how it will continue. It's very difficult to to say how uh, how rates are globally are going to go. Uh, but f f historically, there has been volatility and it's been managed well. We will continue to use the same tools that we have at our hands to manage the cost of funds and to manage the NIMS. And hopefully they serve us uh, well uh, for for the coming period as well. Any other questions? Joyce Matthew. 
Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Sheikh Hello. Walid. Hello. Fine. Thank you. How are you? Uh, Sheikh Walid, thank you for the presentation and uh, for uh, uh, detailing about your strategies and everything. But I have uh, one question. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, uh, one of the aspects that we didn't touch upon is uh, the liquidity management of the of, of bank market. Uh, when we look at uh, your uh, uh, your uh, loan to deposit ratio, your gross loan to deposit ratio is around 115 percent, and net loan to deposit is around 109, and it's it's at a historically uh, highest levels uh, except 2017. So. Uh, how so uh, given given the scenario that if things go normal and if things improve uh, uh, how do you manage to uh, 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 how, how are you planning to manage uh, your, your deposit base and uh, 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 given that bank market is the largest one with almost you know 35 40% of the total deposit size do you see there will be further pressure on 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 the uh, cost of funding uh, Especially that your CASA is sixty-five percent, and uh, then the, the next, probably the next uh, source that you have to look at is probably the, the time deposits. So, do you think there will be a, a change in the market dynamics, and uh, and on the deposits? Now, how are you planning to? What is what are your strategies for raising the deposits? Okay, for that I need to take you back a little bit to 2021 and 2022. Uh, in 2021, if you, if you look at our loan to deposit ratios and, and in general our liquidity ratios, you'd see that they're, they're quite, uh, quite, healthy, quite healthy levels and that was intentional. We were going through a pandemic time and so much uncertainty out there, so we made sure that uh, the liquidity position of the bank is is quite healthy. We came on to 2022, and of course that comes at a cost. Uh, we came on to 2022, and we okay now the situation is improving. Let us actually moderate our uh, deposit uh, base because that comes at a at a at a, at a cost, like uh, like I said, and that's what we we had done, and we had done that on on purpose. Um, and that's why you see uh, the levels, they're still at healthy levels, but they've gone up for, compared to a level where it was also intentionally done uh, to, to remain low at that time. It was also lower at that time because uh, the growth in the loan book was not, uh, was not there. And hence, uh, the dynamics now have changed, there is growth, there is positive momentum. Um, in terms of deposit growth, Obviously, one main factor for us is uh, the retail uh, base that we have, the branch network that we have, and that continues to expand, and that, you know, the large customer base that we have, and that continues to expand. So CASA is a very important component for us, um, and it's not something that yeah, I mean, we are going to, uh, we're going to continue to build on that, and we're going to continue to make sure that's a, that's a, that's a large part of our strategy and continue to build on the strength of, uh, of that. Uh, in terms of uh, fixed deposits, yes, uh, we are uh, going to continue to build on time deposit, but only subject to recognizing and seeing the growth uh, in loans coming through. Uh, yani if situation changes uh, globally and we see a slowdown in economies and we see growth rates not coming the same way that, that we had uh, projected, and therefore our balance sheet growth is, is not as we had projected, then uh, we will moderate our uh, yeah, any deposit, uh, 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 you know, uh, we'll moderate our time deposit, uh, what's the word? Uh, this cold is, <laughs> the medication that I'm taking is, uh, we'll moderate, you know, our, uh, the growth in, in fixed deposits or, or uh, attracting fixed deposits and the, and the pricing in terms of the aggressiveness of it and, and so on. So, so yeah, we, we just have to ba we keep balancing uh, keep balancing things as, as we progress. But it has to be, if we grow deposits, it has to be matched with a growth in, in the loan book as well. Okay, I understood that. But one of the reasons why, uh, where am I coming from uh, is because we are seeing a potential consolidation and a potential you know, reduction in the cost of funds. 
uh, uh, for the competition and that leaves the competition you know to be a room for being very aggressive and bank musket you know, and other banks not only really bank musket other banks probably might have to you know or get ahead of the competition uh, so have you thought about this scenario uh, and uh, uh, how are you planning to tackle this? So uh, I'm saying the competition, the consolidated ones, you know, could get aggressive in the uh, demand space and we have limited space for CASA, CASA growth. So you know, but, what, what are your views on that? But uh, consolidation is not a single event. Yeah, I mean, competition has been quite aggressive throughout these years. It has never stopped. Uh, consolidation is just one factor, and I don't think it's the event that's going to be making competition even more fiercer and, and so on. This, uh, this uh, the competition has always been quite strong in the retail, uh, in the retail space. And, um, you know, we, can, we continue to, to have to evolve and develop new products and develop services. And at the end of the day, it's going to be a uh, game of uh, who, can do it, uh, who can do it better. We have been doing this for the last uh, many years as, as far as back muscle. So, I mean, like I said, at the end of the day, it goes back to the fundamentals. And if you have the right fundamentals in place and you keep building on your strategy and make sure that you continue to invest in the right resources, and the, the right capital, and the right technology, and so on. That's how you fend off uh, competition. But just having a, because of consolidation, uh, yeah, and this will, today is this consolidation, tomorrow maybe there is another consolidation. So it's not something that's yeah, I mean, uh, putting me in a, in a situation where uh, I'm coming from a comfort zone. We were always active. We were always competitive, and we will continue to be uh, to be competitive. Understood. Thank you very much, Sheikh Walid, and uh, and uh, team. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Any other questions? Going once. Okay, so we reach at 1:53 p.m. I, uh, since I don't see any more questions, I think I will conclude the session by thanking all the participants. We really thank you very much for being with us uh, today, and uh, wishing you all uh, all the best and uh, have a nice weekend.